Early assumptions that one might make from a sliding filament model for contraction, a model in which shortening of sarcomeres is presumed to be due to actin sliding against myosin, would lead to some predictions. Specifically during contraction, thick and thin filaments should bind to one another. That makes eminent sense if you're going to use that sliding to pull the Z lines closer to one another. Clearly, you would model the role of ATP in fueling the sliding of the filaments, because after all, the sliding of the filaments and the contraction of a muscle is a form of motility that would require free energy. And given what we know, and given the paradox, you would also have to put into your model that ATP should cause actin and myosin to come apart. How was this eventually shown? Well, it began with an attempt to separate or fractionate muscle cells into their components in order to see how the components interact. In other words, dissecting the sarcomere. And in the process, purifying actin, or at least partially purifying actin and myosin. So you start with skeletal muscle, you homogenize it, you do a little extraction, begin to purify proteins one from another, spin, meaning centrifuge, to separate parts based on mass. Look in the electron microscope. And what you find are two fractions, one containing actin on Z lines, and the other containing thick filaments. In fact, they are the thickness predicted for myosin. So we have separated actin and myosin, although the actin is still associated with those Z lines. So if we've taken these two things apart and we want to know if they are reflective of what they originally looked like, an intact muscle, we need to put them back together and see if they can do something that is muscle-like. So we reconstitute Z-line actin complexes with these thick filament preparations. And when they're mixed together under the right conditions, they reassemble. And if you look in the electron microscope, lo and behold, it looks for all the world like sarcomeres. I'm not labeling anything here, but you can tell what the Z lines are. They're the vertical lines, and the actin or the thin filaments coming off and projecting into a sarcomere. And they have already interdigitated with the myosin, the thick filament. So we've demonstrated that actin and myosin do bind. So that was one of our predictions, and that turns out to be true. Now, look what happens... If you add ATP, let's do that again. You add ATP and it is hydrolyzed and the sarcomeres shorten. And you can actually do this with a preparation of self-assembled sarcomeres and then look at the results in the electron microscope as well and see the shortened sarcomere. So we can now say that contraction does indeed require ATP and in the process the ATP is hydrolyzed. We have one other component. We said that in order that the sliding filament mechanism explain contraction, it also has to explain relaxation. That is, the binding of actin and myosin has to be reversed at some point in order to relax a muscle. Otherwise, the muscle is in rigor. Here's how it was done. You could add ATP to these, I use the word in quotes, contracted sarcomeres, add the ATP back, but this time vigorously agitate. Put them in a vortex machine or sonicate them. Do something to keep things moving. In the presence of ATP, the Z-line actin complexes come apart from the thick myosin filament. Again, you can see this in the electron microscope, from which we can conclude that ATP is indeed required for actin and myosin to separate. We can conclude that the thick and the thin filaments, the myosin and the actin, do bind during contraction, and that ATP is needed for contraction and for the dissociation of actin and myosin at some point. It turns out that ATP hydrolysis does indeed supply energy for contraction, but exactly when in the process of sliding of filaments this happens remain to be worked out.